Christmas is almost here, man. It's a little bit over a week away. Can you believe that? It's crazy. But almost, New Year's almost here as well. So uh, it's, uh, I'm just looking forward to all that God has in store for us this coming year, 2018. It's crazy. It's 2018. I remember being a kid like, wow, the year 2000, you know what I mean? And here it is 18 years later, and it's, it's crazy. But, you know, we're just so thankful for this time of year, and we love this time of year. It's when we remember the, the why of the season. We can, you know, we, it's easy to remember all the what's that we have to do, uh, what's next on the to-do list, but like I've been saying for the past few weeks, that, that it's important for us to remember the why of Christmas. See, it's, it's easy for us to remember that Jesus came, but it's important for us to remember why Jesus came. We've been talking about heaven on earth and God becoming flesh and dwelling among us. See, Christmas season is so much fun. The decorations, the giving, the party, the, the family gatherings, all the things that we do, all the, all the shopping, the gift giving, and it's a lot of fun. It's a joyful time of the year. We all love it and look forward to it. And there's things that you do this time of year that you can't do any other time of the year. And that's what makes it so special. Those Christmas dinners, you know, you get to buy the, the eggnog and the candy canes and all those, all those special things. And we love to make, the, the make Christmas special for the girls. You know, we do things like making Christmas cookies and, and, and different things. One thing that we do is the day after Thanksgiving is that we, as a family, we put our, we put our Christmas tree up and we decorate the, the Christmas tree. You know, I think family traditions are important and, it, and they really make the Christmas season very special and meaningful as, as, as the children grow up and to, to really draw us closer as a family. So the day after Thanksgiving, we put the, the Christmas tree up. We decorate the Christmas tree, you know, and the, the girls that put the Christmas ornaments on where they think they should be. And then when they go to sleep, Danielle rearranges them and puts them where they need to be. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, and it's a whole lot of fun. So we, we do that. We put on the, the Christmas music. They put, we, we make the hot cocoa. We might put a fire in the, in the fireplace and just have a, a good time, you know, and we do that we've been doing it every year ever since the girls are very very young they still are very very young but we're trying to establish some christmas traditions you know and uh one thing that they do also is they get together with some of their cousins you know and they live in other parts of the of the state and they they come together and they build gingerbread houses one day and they they love it and they have so much fun doing that and we want to keep that as a tradition where they can spend some time with their family um during the holiday season and it's great, and they, they build it, and then they eat it, and they come home, they don't want to eat supper, but it's a whole lot of fun, you know what I mean? And uh, so we're just, we love this time of year, but one thing that we always try to do is we try to go somewhere to see Christmas lights, you know? And it's a very simple thing that we can do as a family, whether it's driving around. And the girls are always amazed that it doesn't matter what Christmas lights we see, they get so excited, look at those, you know? And I'm just like, wow, I've seen it a million times, you know? And last year we went to the the, the, the light festival in, uh, in Mystic, and you know, it was just so busy, and it was beautiful though. You know, actually the, the exit to Mystic was shut down. They wouldn't let anyone else in there. It was so busy, but this year we weren't able to do that, but we did look at some lights around here, and we had a great, great, great time, and uh, you know, one thing that, one place that we looked at, I don't know if you've been down here on Montauk Avenue, and, and there's that, that house. It's like, it, it like glows into outer space. Anybody see it? It's across the street from the church, but, but we went there, and I remember when I first came down to New London, I saw this house, and it was crazy. It, it, like, it seemed like it literally glued, gl glowed into outer space. It, it was flashing, and, and lights were dancing. It was going, brr, brr, brr. I'm like, what's going on? It's cool and everything, but this is crazy what's going on here. And I'm, I'm going by night after night, night after night, and then one day it dawned on me, and I saw it. There's a sign that says, tune in to 88.5, you know? And when I found out that it was, it was synchronized to, to music, it all made sense after that, you know what I mean? But I encourage you to check it out. It's a great time. The girls love it, you know? But, um, but you know, the thing about Christmas lights is that, you know, even in the darkness, it, it, it illuminates, and they're just, it's just so beautiful. And even Christmas lights are a, a great reminder a great reminder of the light of the world that came to earth. A great reminder of Jesus Christ. The light of the world that was sent here. Heaven came to earth and, and stepped into the darkness of the world and shed his lights. God became, God became flesh. He came to the earth, born of a virgin, announced by angels, and, and men traveled hundreds of miles to see this little baby 
to celebrate his birth. And we still celebrate his birth to this day. It's where they say they came to see God who became flesh, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, the light of the world. And that came to life Friday night when we watched the Nativity movie. You know, we were able to see all that, that whole story come to life, and it was great. But this is week two of Heaven on Earth, and uh, this is the, we're going to be talking about the light of Christmas. And we're going to talk about, go through some scripture here about the Christmas story, but, and actually talking about Jesus being the light of the world. And we're going to read from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. If you have your Bible, I encourage you to open it and, and read along, but if not, you can follow up on the screen. In the beginning was the Word, the Bible says. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So when it's saying the Word, it's talking about Jesus Christ. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Through who? Through Jesus. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The, the, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. Imagine that, coming to the world that you created, and the world didn't even give you the time of day in some respects. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become Children of God, those who believe, become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh. That's what Christmas is all about here. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Jesus, the light, he came into the darkness and shed his light. You ever been, were you ever afraid of the dark when you were a kid? I know I was tremendously afraid younger when I was when I was when I was really young about the the dark. And I always need a night light. You know, even my girls to, the, to this day they they need a night light on or the hall light on with the door cracked just a little because you know when I was a little bit little kid I was always really concerned about what might be under my bed or what might be in my closet. So when I went to bed I made sure that the the closet was shut and that my arm was not hanging over the bed because who knew what lurked underneath that bed? You know. And I always made sure that that night light was on. The funny thing about light is that no matter how much darkness you have, it cannot defeat the light. I don't know, maybe you're an adult today and you're still afraid of the dark. I don't know, but <laughs> put on your night light. Because <laughs> there's never enough darkness to drown out the light. The darker it is, the, the brighter the light shines. Time after time in the Bible, Jesus is, is called the light of the world. He, he, he's, he's called the light. He, he comes into the darkness and he, and he sheds the light. He calls us the light of the world. But we have Satan, our spiritual enemy. And Jesus defeats his darkness. In John 8, 12, 8 verse, chapter 8, verse 12, says, I am, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And we're going to be going through John chapter 8, if you want to turn your Bible there, and we're going to follow through that there. Right before Jesus talked about being the light of the world, it was a story about a lady who was caught in the act of adultery. And this was a very serious accusation back in those days, and it's still a, a very bad thing. But we're going to be talking about some things today. The, we're going to be talking about three things today. The law, the love, and the light. 
Sounds like a crazy soap opera, doesn't it? <laughs> the law, the love, and the light. First point, the first thing I want to talk about is the law reveals our guilt. In John chapter 8, verses 2 through 6, it says, At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the, law of Mo, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. In the law, Moses commanded us to, to stone such a woman. Now, what do you say? You see, what they're trying to do is they're trying to trap Jesus. They're always trying to make him stumble and, and try to trap him in his words to try to discredit him and, and catch him off guard and, and kind of be able to point fingers at him. So now, what do you say? They're using this question to trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. You see, according to the law, this, this woman was guilty. She was caught in the act of adultery. But because of the law, she, she, the law says that she was supposed to be stoned to death because she cheated on her husband, and that was the law. And that's what they lived by at the time. For the Jewish religion, that was one of the, one of the three most serious sins that somebody could possibly commit worthy of being put to death by stoning, which meant that stones the size that you could grab like this were thrown at them until they died. Very brutal. So they're trying to trap Jesus, and they, they said, now what do you say? So if, if Jesus answered incorrectly during that time, which he wouldn't because he's Jesus and he's God, but they're trying to get him to, to, to answer this question in a way where they could trap him. And if Jesus agreed to, 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 the, to, to the stoning of this lady, he'd lose his reputation of being loving and full of grace. He wouldn't be in the character of God. If Jesus said, don't stone her, he'd be condoning adultery, breaking the law of Moses. So he's kind of between a rock and a hard place, pardon the pun. And they're very aware of the law, the law of Moses, what's, what they were following. And the thing about the law is it reveals our sin. It revealed their sin. It revealed her sin. And it reveals our guilt. All of us at some time, we've, we've lied or maybe we've stolen, maybe we've lusted after somebody or maybe we've used God's name in vain. And the law reveals to us the sin, reveals to us the, what we have done wrong, how we have offended God. And unless we recognize our sin, we won't see our need for a Savior. So God brought the law to reveal to us that we aren't good enough. We can't keep the law. So there's only two ways to be saved. Keep the law perfectly or accept Jesus Christ. And there's not one of us that can keep the law perfectly. Because the Bible says if we've broken one of the commandments, we've broken them all. At some point, we've all lied, right? Maybe somebody has, I don't know. Maybe we've stolen. Maybe we, we thought lustful thoughts. And the Bible says when we think lustfully, it's, a, it's, it's just the same thing as, as committing adultery. If we, if we hate somebody, it's committing adultery and committing murder in our hearts. So we've all broken the law. We, are, we all fall short of the glory of God like the Bible says. But it says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And this is the story of Jesus coming to earth, that he brought grace to us. Jesus coming to earth changes everything. Everything. So the law reveals our guilt. And unless we recognize our guilt, we, unless we recognize our sin, we won't see our need for a Savior. Also, the love, of, the love reveals God's grace. We move down to, to chapter, to verse, to verse 6. It says, but Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. 
So here they have this lady, and she's accused of adultery, one of the, the, one of the three greatest sins that somebody could possibly do in those times. And there's Jesus on the scene, and this is about to happen. And they see Jesus, this controversial person of the time, who's upsetting the whole religious world in a good way. So he sees what's happening, and they see Jesus, and what does he do? He kneels down, and he begins to write. But what was he writing? The Bible doesn't really say. Makes you kind of wonder. In the later manuscripts that we read studying Scripture, it says that he was writing the names of the accusers. <laughs> Bob. <laughs> Who else is here? Larry. <laughs> um, Veggie Tales, you know? Um, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> But this word that we find in, in here about writing, he says that, 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 he, that he, he, he wrote on the ground. There's, you find this word in the Greek called katagraphin. And we look into that word, and this is what it means. The word kata means against. Graphin means to write down. To write down record against somebody. So Jesus, being God, knew the intents and the hearts of all these men. He knew that there wasn't one man standing there that was without sin. There wasn't one man standing there that was, that was worthy to be able to, to point the finger at this lady. He, he, he knew that man right there was thinking lustful thoughts about somebody. He knew that man over there was having an extramarital affair. He knew that man was lying. He knew that man had a religious spirit. He knew that man didn't, didn't speak honestly the other day. The thing is that we've all have sin and we've all fallen short of the glory of God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what your past is. It doesn't matter what you're going through right now, but, but God's grace is sufficient for you. There's nothing that you have ever done in your life that is not too big for Jesus to forgive. But we've got to recognize it. We've got to recognize it. And humble ourselves. God, I've sinned. God, I've, fa I've fallen short. Forgive me of my sins. Down to verse 7. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who's without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. Greek language, the word for without sin, means without even wanting to do it. And we all sin, right? But when we, when we, when we receive the gift of salvation, God takes away that desire to want this. We, we stumble and we fall, but we want to please Him. We want to honor Him. See, with Jesus, it's more of, because see, back then it was all about the exterior behavior that people looked at. But when Jesus came, he, it became about the, about the heart, about what's going on inside of us. And when he changes our life, when we receive that gift of salvation, he changes us from the inside out. We don't see, always see that evidence right away on the outside. But as he does that work inside of us, we begin to bear fruit on the outside as evidence of our salvation. See, it's more than outward behavior. It's about the heart. It's about a, a changed heart that wants to please God, that doesn't want to sin. So verse 8. Again, he stooped down to write on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. Bob, he got up and left. <laughs> Larry, he got up and left. The older ones first. Until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. So I want you to remember this. Through God's grace, 
you are not what you did. Now, let me be clear here. Jesus isn't saying, go ahead and go, go sin. It's not what he's saying, okay? <laughs> but every single one of us, no matter who we are here today, no matter, no matter who we are, we have some, some dark part to our past. We have some things that we struggled with. We have some things that maybe we're ashamed of. And we begin to sometimes become bound by it or we, or we, or we form an, a, a, an identity around this thing that we struggled with for so long. And I want you to remember that through God's grace, you are not what you have done. You have stolen, doesn't mean that you're a thief now. You have lied, doesn't mean that you're a liar now. You may have committed adultery one time, doesn't mean that you are still an adulterer. You may have gotten divorced, doesn't mean that you are a divorcee. Get your identity in Christ. Because you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things are made new. And for some of us, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this. Because you know what? The Bible says that, that our sin to God is as far as the east is from the west. And how far is that? They're going in two separate directions. He does not recall your sin any longer. Once it's under the blood of Jesus, once we ask for forgiveness, we repent of our sin, we turn the other way, God does not bring it up ever again. So when he looks at you, he didn't say, oh, I remember that time they stole. I remember that time they, they lied. I remember that time they were addicted to that substance. I, I remember that time that they were struggling with prescription drugs. I'm always going to hold them against it. No. When we turn from our sin, he chooses to forget all of our sin. He'll never bring it up again. Never. 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 Revelation 12, Satan's called the accuser of the brethren. It's a name that Satan's called the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that's going to bring it up. He's the one that's going to bring condemnation into your life. He's the one that's going to whisper into your ear, say, hey, you remember that? You're, here you are sitting in church. Here you are lifting up your hands in worship during worship service. But, but you remember what you did yesterday? You remember what, what happened on the, the ride to church this morning? You remember last week when you, when you did this? The Bible says that there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So when he whispers those accusations in your ear, just, just quote that scripture, there's therefore no condemnation. It's under the blood. It's forgiven. And God doesn't even recall it any longer. And some of us are bound by our own sin that's already been forgiven. We hold it against ourselves. We let other people hold it against us. And the only thing that matters is what Jesus says and what Jesus has done. Because when your sins are under the blood, Jesus, God looks at you and sees you the same way he sees his son Jesus. Jesus' blood washes away all of your sin. He's declared you holy. He's declared you the righteousness of God. It's not your righteousness. But the Bible says that our righteousness is as filthy rags. We cannot do good enough. And the Pharisees in the Bible here who are throwing the stones, they're all about doing all the right stuff, keeping all 613 commandments, and they, and they, they wanted to do it to a T, and they're they doing it to, you know, part of them was doing it just to, to make a show and show how holy they were. And Jesus came and said, no, 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 no. It's not about the externals. It's about your heart. And when God changes your heart, it shows up in your externals. But it's not your externals that change your heart. You can be the, the, the greatest, you, you, can, you can be the, the, the best person, you can do all the good, feed the hungry, be the, the greatest philanthropist the world has ever seen, and not make it to heaven. The Bible says that salvation is a gift from God. It's a gift from God, not of works. No religious ceremony, 
No good act, no good work can earn it, but is a gift from God. Because you know what? We're not going to get to heaven and pat ourselves on the back. And, and Jesus isn't going to pat us on the back and say, hey, good job. I'm glad you're so good. Because if, 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 we, if it was based on our own good works, we wouldn't need Jesus. And Jesus' death would be all in vain. So when Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. The Bible says in Revelation that he's defeated. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Forgiven. I remember I was, uh, I was in my early, you know, I, I just, one, one thing I've always struggled with, and I've been doing a lot better lately over these past few years is, man, I, drive, I, I used to drive really fast, you know what I mean? If I had to get somewhere, I got there, you know what I mean? I remember when I was, when I was 16, I was going to go visit my dad up in northern Maine, and I, it usually takes 10 hours, I made it there in seven. You know what I mean? But, but, but God's delivered me from that. But you know what? When I was in my early 20s, I got stopped for speeding. And I was going pretty fast. And I mean, I'm like, oh man, this is not good. And I had to go to court that day. I mean, in a couple of weeks. And I had to stand before the, the prosecutor. And I remember standing in line to see the prosecutor. And I'm, I'm, I'm holding this ticket. And I had to explain myself and see what was really going to happen here. And I was listening to everybody else who was standing in front of me about this, their speeding tickets. And they're all saying, no, 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 that's, that's not what happened. They're arguing like they weren't taking responsibility for what they did. And the prosecutor was getting upset. No, right, all right, I'm writing you a fine, $500, $300, $200. And they'd argue with her. So I got up there and said, yeah, I was going fast. I was late for work, and I just wanted, I needed to get there. It's, it's totally my fault. And she was just like, that's a sigh of relief. You can go. <laughs> I admitted my sin, and I was given grace. And that's what Jesus does for us. We all have a tremendous debt. We all have a tremendous debt load of sin. And we can't pay the price. We don't have enough money for that fine. We don't have enough to, to, to make up for all that sin. He, and Jesus came, he paid a debt that he didn't owe, it's like you owing a million dollars, and as the judge says, you know, either a million dollars, you get locked up for the rest of your life. And somebody comes in and, and, and lays down a million dollars on the judge's desk and says, the fine's paid. Someone else paid the price for you, and you were set free. And that's what Jesus did. He paid a price that, that, that you couldn't pay and paid a debt that he didn't owe. See, Jesus didn't say that you now you're forgiven, and I understand that, you know, and, and we, we, we can be mixed up a little bit about God's grace and think that, well, Jesus, this is just the way that I am, and God understands. See, God loves you too much to let you stay the same. That's the power of grace, is it brings change into our life. It gives you the, the power and the strength and the confidence and the, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to be victorious in your life. He doesn't say, understand you're, just, you're this way, so just keep on sinning. Well, my dad didn't love you, and I'm just searching for love, or maybe, oh man, I have my needs, you know? Or I'm always going to struggle with lust, or I'm always going to overeat, I'm always going to overspend, I'm always going to gossip, I'm always going to be critical and bitter. That's just the way that I am. That, that, that's my personality. That's who I am. And we find these excuses. But Jesus declared this in verse, eight, verse 11. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. He said, go now and leave your life of sin. It was an urgency. It was a now. We, they were trapped in darkness. But Jesus set you free. We can choose to be bound in that life of sin, or we can step into the freedom that Jesus offers us. The light came into the world, into the darkness, and he set us free from the power of sin in our lives. Maybe it's a secret, the secret, uh, the secret life that you live. Maybe it's, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's materialism and anger or, or unforgiveness or, or could be a controlling attitude. Maybe it's a critical spirit. 
You feel so much shame. You don't like yourself. You feel like harming yourself, maybe. And you've got all these doubts. But Jesus says, go now and leave your life of sin. Make a choice to follow Jesus. So the law reveals our guilt. The, The love reveals God's grace. And thirdly, the light reveals our hope. Verse 11 says, go now and leave your sin that's full of hope. See, we don't have to walk in the darkness. Now let's move down to verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. Those who believe in me, whoever follows me, will never walk in darkness but will have the light of light. See, when Jesus said, I don't condemn you, when he said he was not the light of the world, he wasn't just the, he's not just the light of the world to this lady. He, was, he said to this lady, I, neither do I condemn you. And in that moment, he wasn't just the light of the world, he was the light of her world. And Jesus isn't just the light of the world, but he's the light of of your world. Verse 46, I'll wrap this up and Mike come up. It says, I have come into the world as a light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. See, nothing gives hope like a, like a light. When I was a kid and, and, the, and the lights were turned off and I was scared when my mom turned on that light, it gave me so much hope. And in the darkness of this world, when Jesus comes in and when Jesus stepped into this world, he gave us hope that we will not be lost in our sin, that, that we won't have to try to pl- just, just, just keep on keeping all the laws in order to earn our way to heaven. See, the, the light always defeats darkness. And there's not enough darkness in this world to put out the light of even the smallest candle. But Jesus is the light of the world. The light came. He was born. He's born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and he came to set us free. Let's pray. The Bible says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the enemy. The light came into the darkness to set us free. Maybe you're here today and man, you're experiencing some darkness in your life. Maybe it's a secret sin. Maybe it's a, a, something that you're, you're, you're just afraid that if anybody ever finds out. Maybe it's a part of your life that you've not surrendered to Jesus Christ. I'm asking you today, will you let the light into the darkness? Will you let the light of Jesus Christ into that dark place in your life? Maybe you're here today and you just want to make that, you just want to make that choice. You want to surrender to him. Say, God, man, I, I just want to surrender this area of my life to you. I just want you to take some time and, and just go before him and pray as we worship him. Father, today we just come before you and we we surrender ourselves to you. In those areas of darkness that are in our life, Lord, we want your light to shine on it, Lord. We want you to, to just we want to experience your freedom in our life, whether it be addiction, whether it be a secret sin in our life. Maybe it's a habit, Lord, just something that, Lord, we know it displeases you, but, but today, let your light shine down on us. Let your light shine in the darkness. Drown out the darkness in our life, Lord. There's sin in our life. We ask you to forgive us, to cleanse us. Give us victory over those areas of our life that we keep on stumbling in. Lord, we know that your grace is sufficient. We trust in your power. We trust in your word. And we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen.